Welcome everybody to our service at Clement for Sunday morning, the 27th of June. Um, my name is Martin Russell, I'm one of the elders at Clement, and I'll be joined today and helped by Dorothy Lynn, who's taking our reading, by Leslie Ogilvy, who'll be leading our prayers for others, by Anna Weir, who's doing the signing, uh, also by the praise band who are providing the music for today's service. And as always, I'd like to thank Martin Grant for doing the recording, Davy Jones for putting the music together, and Lewis Hunter who puts the whole thing together. So thank you all. Let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. As we come together and worship today, each in our own homes, unite our hearts and minds in our worship of you. Take from us the stress and strain of the past week, of our cares and troubles, and let us centre our scattered senses upon the presence of the living God. Amen. I just want to say a few words before our first prayer, praise. During the pandemic, and indeed in many of our services before then, we've been blessed with music from the praise band, now one of the distinct features of Clement's worship. But it was not always so. It was not always Clement that had the main worship group in this area. Fifty years ago, when I was in the youth fellowship and on the seaside mission team, we only had guitars and an accordion in church on rare occasions, usually the service after the seaside mission team returned from North Berwick. No, it was Moncrief that had the big praise group, New Horizon, including Catherine and Dave McLaren, Helen Cuthbertson, and Davy Jones, as well as some who are now members of Calderwood Baptist Church. They were led by Ian Watson, who now runs the Praise Gathering, and they recorded songs on tape. Do you remember cassette tapes? Including the first, or nearly the first, recording of Shine, Jesus, Shine by Graham Kendrick. I got all the tapes I could, as I loved the new church music so much. In the mid-1980s, our family moved for a time to Stockport and returned a few years later. So for three months each time, I was living in one place and the family in another. But I travelled each weekend to see them, often by car, and I played and sung along to tapes to keep me awake and alert, particularly the New Horizon tapes. Our first praise item today comes from that time. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It was for long one of my favourites, which is slightly surprising because the chorus doesn't rhyme and I don't generally like songs like that. I played it repeatedly as it's a great message and gave solace to me in separation. Later, I realised that it came directly from Scripture from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. So, over to Davy Jones. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Every morning, you every morning, 
good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that we should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So let us examine all our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Let us come to God in prayer again. Great God, faithful God, merciful God, loving God, we come together this day to praise and adore you. We thank you that you are our loving Father who cares for us, who wants the best for us, who longs for us to rely wholly on you, who wants to share us with your blessings, who gave your son up to death for us. But death was not the end, and we thank you for Jesus' resurrection and the promise of life with you. And yet, Lord, we can hardly believe the riches you have given us, as we are a sinful people. We fail you in so many ways, in what we do, what we say, how we act, and in what we fail to do for you. Forgive us in your great mercy, Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We thank and praise you for your constancy, Lord. You're always there for us, always with us. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. What a great God we have. What a great God we worship. Great is your faithfulness. What would life be without you beside us? Thank you for all you do for us. We can never repay you, but we thank you for your grace to us. Let us now join together in the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven. Our reading today is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading verses 7 to 15. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. But if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Amen. What really annoys you? What are your pet hates? We've all got them. During this pandemic, many might say lockdown, uncertainty, 
the slowness of government to let us know what's changing. Of course, they can't. It all depends on what the virus is up to and what effects it's having. The way some people flaunt the rules quite openly and expect to get away with it, it's their right. Or the limited numbers being allowed to meet up at weddings or funerals. Oh, but then there's the Euros. Oh, that's another matter. We all have to get together for that, even if it's only to go all the way to London in a packed train to go to the pub there, as we didn't ever have tickets for the match. It says a lot about Scottish pubs. But for many of us, our pet hates might be the cold callers on the phone or mobile, wanting to sell us the latest things, trying to get money from us by claiming to be from Amazon, BT, HMRC, they all worry me. For how do elderly people cope with seemingly plausible stories asking for money in quite a backhanded way? Money that you owe. But one of my pet hates is the way that you give to charities, only for them to hassle you every time there's a new emergency, a new crisis, including a shortage of funds during the pandemic, as if you hadn't given them enough in the first place. If I've given careful thought to, to regular giving to various charities, Christian or otherwise, why expect me to change my priorities for giving because your charity needs money? Do the others not need it as well? And how well do you use the money? And do you pass my details on to other charities so they can hassle me as well? Some do and go straight off my list of charities to support in the future. On the face of it, Paul makes a good model here for getting money for someone else. It all looks, at first glance, to be about money. Is this the first example of a pastor promoting a stewardship campaign, looking to get money to help, uh, looking to get people to give more money to help someone else? In Clement, the Kirk Session have been discussing whether we should have a stewardship campaign. But a stewardship campaign isn't just about money. It's about how we contribute our time, talents and possessions, including money. But the Church of Scotland seems to focus particularly on the financial side, reflecting the current state of the Church's finances. And it was the major question put to the session as to whether we should have one soon. Don't worry, this sermon is not part of a stewardship campaign and I'm not asking for money for the church. But there are important principles underlying Paul's letter and concerns. First of all, in verse 7, he seems to be buttering them up for what's to come. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. The church in Corinth was, to say the least, a challenging one for Paul. It held many joys and many concerns for him. Paul had a difficult relationship with the Corinthian church. He was going to Corinth, but walking on eggshells. He wanted to make sure that by the time he arrives in Corinth, the church will have put aside the full amount of money they are going to contribute for the impoverished Jerusalem church. He was determined to press ahead and get them to complete the task. He doesn't just want to be fully and delightfully reconciled to the Corinthians. He wants them to share in the great project he has in mind, demonstrating to the Gentile churches that they are part of the same family as the Jewish church, uh, Christians in Jerusalem, and more important, demonstrating to the Jerusalem Christians that those strange, uncircumcised Gentiles who, like them, have come to believe in Jesus the Messiah are fellow members with them in God's renewed people, the family defined by their faith in the risen Jesus as Lord. So he starts by reminding them how far they've come in their faith, what their strengths are. They're starting from a good base. They excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love. So they're in a good position. They can continue to grow. 
Paul, when writing early to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 to 4, had instructed them, along with the other churches, to set aside each week an offering for the needs of the church in Jerusalem. He now picks this up. They had promised to give a contribution to the church in Jerusalem, but they'd stalled. Either the collections had gone down or stopped completely. During a leadership course for work, we had to look at our personalities, how we worked, our roles in a team. I discovered then that I'm not a finisher, as they put it. I look into something in great depth, have good ideas, but don't press on regardless to get to the end of a project and move on to the next one. Fortunately, it only supplies to some things, not services and sermons. Sorry, but this is not as far as I've got to in this sermon. If you're doing something, you can't be half-hearted. Learning a musical instrument or gardening, there's no point starting and then stopping after a few weeks with the job half done. You have to finish what you've started. So it was for the Corinthian church. He wants them to finish what they've started. They're starting from a good base, so press on to finish the task. Paul is desperately concerned for the unity of the whole Christian family, and he has glimpsed, as part of his missionary vocation, the possibility of doing something so striking, so remarkable, so practical, that it will establish a benchmark for generations to come, a sign that Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians really do belong together. In this passage, Paul never uses the Greek words for money. He phrases everything differently in terms of grace. We normally think of grace in terms of the undeserved love and power which God showers on people in bringing them to faith in the first place and enabling them to live and grow as Christians. But here, Paul uses it in a different way to refer to what God wants to do, not just in and for Christians, but through them. He had given grace to the churches in Macedonia. Under impulse from God, they gave money in an almost reckless generosity. But such was their devotion to God, to the Lord Jesus, to Paul himself, and to the work of the gospel and of church unity, that they found it in their hearts to give not only according to their means, but way beyond. Grace, he says to the Corinthian church, don't you want it as well? So he starts by complimenting them on where they've reached, reminds them of their promises, then compares them to the other churches to the north. Talk about twisting your arm up your back, but very carefully. Then he reminds them to give from what they have, not what they don't have. What counts is willingness, not the amount. Then he finishes by pointing out that one day the, moot, the boot might be on the other foot and they need help. It all sounds like a promotional blueprint to me. But what's important is not whipping up human sympathy for a project, nor making people feel guilty, not encouraging social prestige by letting it be known they've given generously, but the work of grace in the hearts and lives of ordinary people. There are important principles underlying Paul's words. What matters first is the basis of their faith, how far they have come in their Christian journey. They excel in, speech, in faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness and love. But Paul now wants to see a demonstrable effect of this, faith in action, if you like, how they show their faith by their actions. He wants to test the sincerity of their love James wasn't the only one to emphasize showing your faith by your actions. So as we would mature in our faith, we should increasingly see this 
in how we offer our time, our talents, our possessions to the Lord's work, in service, in our work with the food bank, in helping others less fortunate than we are, in helping those in need of money, time, care, in how our congregation supports other churches, other projects that need our support. Are we outward looking enough, both as a congregation and as individuals? And where can we make an unexpected and real impact? Secondly, Paul raises an important point about the early and not so early Christian church. They must share. There must be equality. Give according to your means. Help one another as churches. Make sure one church is not in need while you have plenty. He refers to Exodus chapter 16, verses 17 to 18, when the Israelites were to gather manna. The Israelites did it as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, a small bowl, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. How can we help our neighbours, our community, our world? Are major global issues part of our prayers and concerns? Are there any practical ways we can help? Or the, can we influence politicians? What about the UK government's position on reducing foreign aid? If we all complained about it, would it not make a difference? Or what about equity in sharing the COVID vaccines? What would Jesus have us do? But the central point Paul is making is the most important one at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. The example of Jesus should inspire the Corinthians and all Christians, especially when they recall that by that self-chosen poverty of the Lord, they have entered into an inheritance of spiritual wealth. And when verse 9 says, he became poor, it's not ju just that he was not rich, royal and splendid in the world's terms, but his willingness to leave heaven, to limit himself to an earthly body, to die for men's sins on the cross. Paul underlines here the beating heart of the gospel itself, the death and resurrection of Jesus. The core motivation for our actions must be love, God's love for us, and from this, our love for others. To live a life which reflects our faith is not a matter of carrying out noble deeds with indifference or for show, but out of love and wanting the best for each other. The prophet Micah says in chapter 6, verse 8, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And then there's Jesus' comments on the widow's offering in Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Jesus also said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. So what do our actions show about where our treasure is? As you grow in your faith, so you must grow in your discipleship, seeking to address the imbalances between people here and beyond. And underscoring this exhortation of Paul's is the reality that, for all of us, 
It is God who provides. We are day by day dependent upon his love and faithful provision. We need to remember the promises of the riches to come, both now and when we are with the Lord. Riches unbelievable. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, as we come to you in faith, help us to show your love and care by our actions. As we live our lives, help us to store up treasures where it matters, in service, in thankfulness and praise. We give our all to you, who gave your all for us. Amen. Lorna Kirk's now going to sing our next item of praise. All to Jesus, I surrender. After that, we'll say the Apostles' Creed together, and then Leslie Ogilvie will lead us in our prayer for others. I believe. Father God, come among us now and join our hearts together with you in our prayers for others. We thank you for our many, many blessings, but keep us mindful of others who are not as fortunate as we may be. The daily suffering imposed upon our fellow men and women throughout the world 
by unscrupulous world leaders and oppressors pains our hearts. How much more does it pain yours? Lord, enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to ease their burdens and suffering in whatever small way we can. Prod and prick our consciences into some form of action, bringing glory to you. We pray especially for all the people in war-torn countries, the homeless and displaced, the refugees, the hungry and the thirsty, the traumatised, the persecuted, the bereaved, the anxious, people who are ill or waiting on test results. Let us all take action to ease their burdens and show your love. Show us how, Lord. You have made us guardians over your beautiful world. Why are we still getting it so wrong? After all this time, and with all our supposed superior knowledge, we seem to be systematically destroying all that we can with each new generation. Touch all of our hearts with a new fervour to protect and sustain your world and everything in it to the very best of our abilities. Help us all to play our part in whatever small way that we can. Amen. Yeah.
good morning.